The Titans expansion has been out for four days, and these are the best decks to grind and hit legend with. Before we jump into the decks, go ahead and like this video and subscribe to the YouTube channel in order to let me know that you want more Clark content. As of right now, I need all the support that I can get in order to continue daily videos and, you know, daily Twitch streams. So if you want this kind of content, all you have to do is just watch the videos, engage with it, like it, comment, do everything that you can in order to engage with the content. Because that way, YouTube will keep pushing my videos to as many people as possible. So if you want more content from this channel, liking this video and subscribing to the channel is the best way that you can support. But now that you guys have supported the channel, let me support you by telling you what the best decks in the game are, because guess what? Mech Rogue is the best deck in the game, and I know that I was saying that Sif Mage was the best deck in the game, but it's the best combo deck in the game. And unfortunately, aggro decks are just naturally going to feed on the combo decks, and this is just the most unga bunga deck I think I have ever experienced, where it's just all about making a big mech, and then you play, you know, Lab Constructor after you forge it, in order to make even more bigger mechs, and it's just insane how quickly this deck can steamroll. And honestly, I don't even think that Lab Constructor is the most powerful card in this deck. If you want my honest opinion, getting the 1-1s one with, uh, the 1-1 one -one Magnetic Spark Bots are the most powerful cards in this deck, because you can get Wind Fury, and Wind Fury is the reason why I think this deck just blows people out of the water without any without any remorse any chance of being able to bring things back and it's just this is the deck to be playing right now you have prep and you have bone in order to cheat out mechs uh in order to get like you know a uh, a really nice any turn uh early on in the game if you have a really big mech so that way you can give something wind fury so you can set up magnetized combos mimron the mastermind is you know kind of it used to be like the main star of the deck, but it's no longer the star of the deck anymore, but he's still really powerful in order to give you cards that either deal damage or turn minions to hand, or even swapping attacks of cards, which is absolutely bonkers if you can set up a really big mech and then switch uh, targets to essentially have Wind Fury enabled, but in a different way. Like, it's kind of funny how this deck just deals its damage twice so consistently. You have Spider in the deck in order to give you really uh, consistent ways of cheating out gigantic Lab Constructor uh, turns, where people are going to have to start running, like, massive AoEs in order to remove this stuff, but you can't get rid of every single mech, which is the big problem with a deck like this, is that every mech that survives is an actual threat because of how much magnetization can go on. And Ventomatic is a great way in order to snowball an early mech, and there's just... There's a lot going for this deck right now, and I'm pretty sure you guys have been rolled by this deck, or you have been rolling with this deck, because it just feels like an unstoppable force if you get the perfect draws and your opponent cannot deal with the gigantic mech that you throw down. Also, Coppertail Snoop, amazing card in order to give you even more mana sheet, and this card is amazing on coin, to where when I looked at the stats, this was the card with the highest mulligan win rate, which was really surprising to me. I thought that the Lab Constructor would be, especially on coin, but being able to, you know, get more uh, value off of your earlier turns goes a long way, especially when this card has Wind Fury. So if you want to be grinding the ladder with the best deck to be playing right now, I cannot recommend Mech Rogue anymore. But if you want to spin on the same deck and you want to go in a little bit of a different direction, there is another version of the deck that is seeing play right now. However, I would argue that this list is a lot... I don't want to say worse because this deck is bad, but it's just slower and you want to be able to close out decks quickly with Mech Rogue so your opponent doesn't find that silence, doesn't find the key card that they need in order to destroy your big mech. So if you want to play a bigger mech, you can play, you know, Scourge Illusionist with Containment Unit, which is a pretty interesting combo in order to give you a lot of different ways of pressuring the board with gigantic minions that can summon even bigger minions off of the 8 drops. But I still, I still say that the first deck is better to play, but this deck might be a little bit more fun if you're looking for a different way to pilot this deck. In all honesty, I'm not a big fan of Mistake, but I kind of understand why this is in the deck in order to just try and get that, uh, that early mech synergy as quickly as you can. But in all honesty, I would probably just cut, what, what would I cut this card for? I really don't even know. I can't even give you an idea of what else to play in this deck just because the other deck is just so much better. But regardless, if you want bigger mechs, Containment Unit actually feels pretty good off of uh, Scourge Illusionist. 
Next up, we have the best deck in the game, according to me, because I still think that Sif Mage is one of the best decks that you can be playing right now, but there are a lot of different builds of the deck, but this is the deck that I believe is the best at top 1000 Legend. You might be able to argue that this deck is way, uh, it's way too focused on popping off the combo, but I believe the combo is the reason why this deck is so massively powerful, to where going for tempo can be important with, like, keyboard and cold case and whatnot, but this deck has just so much consistency because of Lady his jar. I already talked about this uh, this card a little bit in my uh, recent video about Sif Mage, but the reason why this card is absolutely core is because of its ability of being able to reduce the cost of your spells in hand. So decks like Control Priest, Blood DK, Armor Warrior, if they happen to have, you know, like 60, 70 life, you legitimately do not care about that because you can reduce your one mana cards to deal damage to deal zero, or, or sorry, to, to zero mana. You can have your Molten Rune go to two mana. You can have your reverberations go to two mana which trust me when you have a plus eight sif when you have plus 16 spell damage there's almost no way you are not gonna find lethal the biggest thing about this deck is knowing when to go for what win condition such as going for tempo with uh with as many minions on the field as possible when to go for the unga bunga combo that your uh, control decks are not going to be able to outlast or when you need to go for just a simple spell damage combo of 30 where if Sif is at plus 7, and you have a, a Molten Rune that's already been forged, and a 1-mana spell that deals damage to the Arcane Bolt, then you are going to deal exactly 30 damage. So this is a deck that really incentivizes you to know how you're going to win, and to set up that combo versus just being like, I'll get there eventually. And I feel like a lot of people right now are playing away their key cards when they don't realize that it's a key card, such as, for example, if you played your Molten Runes and you don't have the Lady Nis Jar as a uh, possibility to discount your hand, so you have to go for a 30 damage combo. It just, it, it really depends on what you're trying to set up with this deck, but it has a lot of ways of seeing play, and I see a lot of players kind of undervaluing how difficult this deck can be to play. Like, yes, it does have those interact, uh, those uninteractive games where Sif comes down and you just automatically lose, but there are ways to counter this deck. But I'll tell you right now, the most popular, the most powerful card in this deck is actually the 4-drop mech. Like, this card goes super hard at being able to keep yourself alive to where Solid Alibi is still a card I think that needs to be nerfed. But this card is the most powerful card in the game because it helps you to sustain yourself in a different way that isn't just playing Solid Alibi. It's it's honestly bonkers how good this card is, uh, especially after you've discovered every single spell school that you possibly can. So it can deal 8 damage AoE for 4 mana. That's just massive. But Sif Mage, in my opinion, is still the best deck to be playing on the ladder. If you're not seeing a lot of Mech Rogue, Mech Rogue makes this matchup a little bit hard and Reverberations can save you. But Mech Rogue has a lot of high rolls with Wind Fury and with Divine Shield that sometimes can give this deck a run for its money. Next up, we have Nature Shaman, and I have to apologize for the first video that I posted on this, but keep in mind, it was a day one deck that I was playing, but after some optimization, I think that this is one of the best versions of Nature Shaman that we can be playing. And I actually have four Nature Shaman lists that I'm going to show you guys, because I want to show you what's kind of like, what's changing about the deck, where people's thoughts are going with this, because I actually believe that this could be one of the best decks in the game, potentially sitting at tier 1, if we've come across the perfect build that doesn't just fumble automatically to aggro. Because this deck actually has very consistent turn 6 OTKs, where I thought the turn 6 OTK was a bit of a meme or a bit of a high roll, but that actually is somewhat of the norm with this deck, especially if you have Inza on turn 5, or if you have... Uh, if you have Flash of Lightning possible by the by the turn 6, turn 7 uh, setup turn. But the big thing that's really going for this deck that I guarantee everybody has overlooked right now is Totemic Evidence. I am not kidding when I say this is probably the best card in this deck just because of how easy you can set up your Bioluminescence combos now. If you have, uh, like, 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 the Chisel has now been added into the deck. It's now core. You want this in the deck because it gives you a free minion for Bioluminescence. But what if we go a step beyond where we put in Totemic evidence and we infuse this for a one mana summon four play that with bioluminescence and now you have you know plus four spell damage that is super easy to set up and then if you already have a chisel or a tour guide hero power ready to go it is so easy to set up an entire board of seven uh, of seven minions versus what running the champion of storms where you already have to spend four mana plus all the other cards this card is cool, but it doesn't belong in this deck anymore because it's 4 mana, and for 4 mana, you could literally set up plus 4 spell damage like it's nothing. 
And then there's also the possibility of Primordial Wave being really good in this deck in order to counter the Mech Rogues. But I would argue this is a card that a lot of people are probably going to cut because unless you're seeing like mostly Mech Rogues, this card doesn't really feel that good. So I'm actually working on a different list uh, that I will be streaming over at twitch.tv slash Clark Hellscream later today in order to see how good Nature Shaman actually is when we can fight more so for tempo. But I would argue this deck is all in on combo. Novice Zapper definitely belongs in this deck because it's zero mana off Inza plus spell damage. Like this, there's, there's just so much going for this deck that I feel like I could, you know, I could teach a class on how interesting Nature Shaman is to me as an archetype, even though it can feel like a very uninteractive matchup that you definitely don't want to go up against. I can, I can, I can concede that point. I understand how uninteractive turn 6 OTKs are, but the massive damage that is even possible through this deck is the main reason why I want to recommend it, to the point where I actually want to show you guys just how nutty this combo can get. In fact, here is a clip of me dealing 79 damage by turn 6 with the deck. Just look at my face. Do you understand the lines? Summoning minion, like look look at how easy this is. This is so easy. It's so free. It's the freest matchup that I think I could come up with. And the funniest thing about this is that I don't even have to go for the random generation, but I wanted to see the Does full Does someone want to count this, this for deck. me? I'm too lazy. Massive. Massive. Massive, dude. Massive damage. To the point where I was double-checking to make sure I didn't accidentally kill myself with that. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's all That's all you really need to know. The, the, the damage potential of this deck is absolutely insane, and someone ended up commenting, uh, fellow content creator Ike, I had over 100 damage earlier. This deck is pretty nuts. So I think that token, uh, token Nature Shaman has a ton of potential going for it. But this is another list that people are trying at with Nature Shaman, where they're putting in School Teachers, uh, Farsight, Lightning Storm, and I think there's one other card. Oh yeah, and the Asharan Scroll. And honestly, I'm not too sure about Scroll. I think this card's kind of weird, in all honesty. What, is this supposed to just try and discover a nature spell? more times than not because you don't really care about frost and fire I, I really don't know why this is in the deck especially when we don't run any dredge cards it just feels like this is like a desperate attempt to try and you know mimic the possibility of what lightning reflexes can do and giving you another damage card but in all honesty this deck has been gaining a lot of gas in a lot of different communities i think on the apex server if i remember correctly because glory has been playing a lot of this deck and has been kind of like I think the poster child of that uh, that server of playing this deck, and Glory's list is actually going to be showcased up next. But this is the list that Glory ended up on, and I, I really like the look of this list just overall. You have Schooling in order to help with like early game uh, pressure, so you can try to keep aggro off the field. Although I would argue that Schooling maybe isn't that good in this deck because it just kind of clunks up hand space some from time to time. Even though you will be wanting to play this card as soon as you can, but if you don't and you're drawing a bunch of cards. Then that's when the hand space gets a little bit clunky because maybe you only get like two piranhas and who really cares about having two piranhas at times? Especially when you're already like at turn six, turn seven, and you're just trying to set up the combo. So I have a version of the deck that I am currently working on and it looks a little something like this. It's a little bit teched to the nines, I'm not going to lie, with like the one primordial wave as like the card I will always keep if I, end, if I end up going up against Mech Rogue. But I like the idea of one overdraft as well because two overdrafts seems a little bit clunky. You don't care that much about trading the card. You just care about unlocking mana crystals whenever it's uh, the best uh, the, the best value and you don't have your Thorum. This also can be just a way of dealing uh, you know damage with a bunch of spell damage already on the field. So maybe putting two in this deck is correct. But overall, I would just rather focus on getting Lightning Bolts and getting the, the Thunder Crashes. Overdraft is just a good card to use in case you have to run a bunch of overload cards all in one turn, and Thorum is just way too expensive in order to play in the same turn. I just really like the idea of one Overdraft being in this deck and one Primordial Wave, but the rest of this deck I feel like is absolutely fine and damn near like core at this point to where Totemic Evidence, I am going to be standing this card until data comes out that proves me wrong if Totemic Evidence is not the way to go. But as I've been explaining for the past couple minutes, Nature Shaman is the nuts right now if you can play this deck perfectly. It's just a matter of finding the perfect 30, and I think that one of the lists that I just showed you today is also going to be the perfect 30, because uh, something that I saw in Bino's chat today is that people aren't running Turn the Tides, and this might be better... Um, 
than schooling in some instances where you can deal, uh, you know, essentially six damage or dealing three damage twice to minions in order to keep aggro off the field. So I really like the idea of running this card and I'm going to be playing this particular deck a lot on my stream today and I think this might be one of the best versions of the deck to play. Next up is the Boogeyman from the last expansion, and honestly, this deck just got a lot better because of the always a bigger Jormungar. This card just obviously pairs really well with Hollowhound, but one thing that you should also consider is Mr. Mukla. Mr. Mukla with this card is literally just an insane amount of value because there aren't a lot of minions that can contest a 10-10, but if you swing a 10-10 into like a 3-2 minion, then suddenly you're dealing an extra, you know, 10 damage because... It does gain two attack and has excess damage dealt to the enemy hero. So it's not just about Hollowhound in this deck, even though Hollowhound is still like the glue that keeps all of this deck contained in all in one because you can play in a lot of different uh, play styles by going to the late game and not being pressured by like other hunters, for example. But regardless, this deck just feels really good with the inclusion of the uh, the one mana spell as well as the Titan Forge traps. This card is essentially like. Oh god, what's that mage secret? It's like the one that cast two and it was uh, corrupted. I forget exactly what the name is. But this is very similar to that card where you forge it and then you play it. But you can possibly play this by turn three if you happen to forge this on turn two. But this is just a really good card because se hunter secrets are really hard to counter right now. Uh, because there are just so many different ways of being able to uh, to pressure onto the board with Hunter Secrets, and there's a lot of requirements that you have to worry about, like attacking a friendly minion, casting a spell whenever a minion dies, hitting the face, uh, de playing three cards, attacking the enemy hero, spending all of your mana. Like this is the reason. Uh, also, playing a minion. Like there are so many ways that the secrets can catch people off guard. To where being able to discover them and then casting it and doing that twice is extremely good because your opponent can't possibly play around it because even if they know that this deck runs two, one combi of zombies, two hidden meanings, you can't play around this card very well. You have to play around all the secrets. And I'll still say this, that, that Bait and Switch is an insanely good card, especially if you pair it with Costume uh, Singer. So I think that this deck has a lot of potential going for it. Uh, the rest of the deck is pretty self-explanatory because it's very similar to what the deck was doing in the previous expansion. But it also does have Prison of Yogg-Saron. I don't know why this is in the deck. It kind of would make more sense to put in maybe like another star power or something. But people are sold on Yogg. I I'm not, I'm not going to look a gift Yogg in the mouth. But this is the only deck that I have seen that is actually playing Prison of Yogg-Saron unironically. And it might make sense as like a way to come back against like the Mech Rogues, for example. I think that might be the reason why this is in this deck. But regardless, if you are a big fan of Hound Hunter, you are probably really happy right now because this deck is still massively powerful. Next up, we have another deck that was really good in the previous expansion, but we now have a solidified version of this deck that runs a little bit of the new cards. Yodin the Eternal absolutely deserves a spot in this deck because imagine being able to cast an extra Relic of Dimensions, an extra Relic of Phantasms. Like, this card just gives you an insane amount of value that this deck really doesn't necessarily need, but it really... Put, like, it, the reason it's in this deck is just because it's good. There are so many really good spells that you want to cast, and, like, the only thing that I feel like is kind of bad about this spell is that your opponent's going to know what's in your hand. But if you're going to play it anyway, it really doesn't make that much of a difference, in my opinion. So, Yodin definitely deserves a spot in this deck. Runic Adornment definitely deserves a spot in this deck. Although, my previous list took it, uh, took School Teacher out of the list in order to put this in here. But, you can definitely run both. I had a comment in my last video be like, the reason why this card may be bad is because it can cause some disenergy with Relic of Dimensions. And I understand that argument. However, when this card is drawing four cards from your deck, I feel like that's not really as crucial and as detrimental, I guess. Because you still have lots of ways of being able to cheat lots of mana, and the cards you're going to be pulling are going to be zero mana regardless. And you're still casting a spell for free, so... I'm going to just let that argument just go under the table because I think that this card is still really, really powerful. And there's also the Argus of the Emerald Star that definitely is still in this deck. Uh, I think the main reason why this is in the deck is because if you have a board of, like, the really big Phantasms, you can immediately give them lifesteal. Or in situations to where this card is, like, zero mana, you can have immediate rush minions. It, that is a really powerful effect. And I think that, you know, obviously setting up taunts is really, really powerful. But being able to reduce the cost of your cards in hand is especially crucial when you have cards like Fizzle and Zymox that work, that work really well when they're discounted. Because you can Fizzle the discounted cards in your hand, you can play Zymox for 6 mana. I don't think you necessarily need to be running the Colossal Minion anymore, but playing this for 5 mana could be kind of cool every now and again. 
But one card that I definitely forgot in my previous video about Relic Demon Hunter is just the Meltranix. Meltranix goes super hard in this deck in order to deny any kind of combo from like the Sif Mage or Control Priest has to have like a very specific card that needs to be on the left or right. Otherwise, they can't kill your board. This deck, this, this card just makes sense in this deck and you definitely want to run it. But Relic Demon Hunter just really feels like the only Demon Hunter deck that's seeing play because the new cards really didn't put the, the, the class in a new direction. Out cast isn't that good and uh aggro demon hunter is a meme it's just a joke actually it's not even a meme it's just a joke it's just that weak right now but if you want to play demon hunter this is probably the only deck that you're going to be seeing play until a mini set comes out in my opinion so the decks that I have shown you so far are the top five decks or deck archetypes uh, of the meta right now at top legend. But if you're not in legend and you're not trying to go for rank one legend, what about just getting two legend? But these decks are just don't see that much play at top legend because of how insane the top legend decks actually are. But on your way to Legend, you can definitely run decks like Secret Hunter. Secret Hunter is probably one of the most powerful Hunter decks that utilizes as many as the new cards as possible. And I have to give this card... Uh, my apologies, because I said this is probably going to be one of the worst Titans in the game, and it turns out it's actually one of the best Titans in the game, because it turns out you just care about getting damage. Like, you just give this weapon plus uh, plus two attack, and you have a three, uh, you have a 5-3 weapon that can keep dealing an insane amount of damage. It's just, this card is just consistent. It deals 15 damage over the course of three turns, and half the time, you're not even going to get to that third turn, because you've already won the game. But yeah, there's a lot of a lot of things going for this deck to where we're running a lot of spell package cards that increase spell damage, and even a poisonous card with ricochet shot, probably in order to deal with the mech robes that are that you're gonna encounter on ladder. So that's why this card is in here with ricochet shot because it makes a lot of sense in order to kill those really big mechs that you just cannot deal with. But the other thing that's really good about this deck in particular is that we have Arcane uh, cards common, uh, combining with Eversong Portal. And we even have Twin Bow Terracoil in this deck in order to potentially deal insane amounts of damage with like Star Power. If you need to kill off a big mech with like a Divine Shield or something like that. But mostly this card is in here in order to cast, you know arcane shots twice or something like that because if you increase the spell damage of this card thanks to brightwing then terra coil plus arcane shot is literally just five mana deal six so there's a lot of potential with this deck and that's not even going into the uh, possibilities of casting arcane quiver as well to where this card can deal four damage and then with a the terra coil it can deal eight damage so secret hunter feels like a deck that is going to be a meta relevant deck going into legend but it starts to fall off the moment you hit legend because if this, this deck just kind of falls apart uh, at times against like the big OTK decks where if you don't win by turn six, then you will be killed by turn six. So Secret Hunter is definitely an archetype I'm going to suggest if you're trying to grind to Legend, but if you're already in Legend, you really only want to queue this deck into Mages in particular. And I feel like that's another reason why this deck is seeing a lot of plays because this was the counter to the Sif Mage meta for the past three days. But regardless, Secret Hunter is definitely one of the best decks you can play if you haven't hit Legend yet. And I gotta give credit where credit is due, but I came up with this list right here a couple of days ago, I think on the very first day of the expansion, and it turns out this is one of the best druid decks to be playing according to the data, and I just gotta, you know, hey, gotta get myself a little ego boost here, because apparently I am a deck innovator, let's go dude. Always happy to see a deck of mine perform really well. But this is the best performing Treant Druid that's just all in on focusing on Treants and building up a big board as quickly as possible because I feel like the aggro deck kind of falls apart very, very easily. The reason why I think this deck is better than going all in on aggro is because it's just about consistently getting out a gigantic board all in one turn. Like, you don't have to build up the gigantic board every single turn from like turn one, turn two, turn three. Why not just do it by turn five? and call it a day when you play Solar Eclipse into Cultivation. So I think that this deck has a lot of potential going for it. However, there might be a way to optimize this deck a little bit because, you know, Summer Flower Child is a great card and all, but, a, but with a deck that really just wants to kill people as quickly as possible, there may be some situations to where it just isn't as consistent. And I have heard some people talk about why is Life Binder Gift in the deck when we're just trying to consistently get out a drum circle with, like, uh, Embrace of Nature. My logic at the time was if you already have drawn your drum circles because you're unlucky, then Embrace of Nature can still draw into Lifebinder's Gift and then you discover random outs like getting like a whirlpool in a situation that you might need it. Not saying it's what you want, but there are some situations that could be good. But the main reason why I kept this in the deck was after I high rolled uh, 
Sunwell off of Plants and Evidence, and then I discarded my uh, discounted my entire hand by one mana. And I think that is, like, you know, the funniest thing that you can do with this deck. But this deck just has a lot of consistency to it, to where I like the idea of running a little bit of random cards in order to give this deck a little bit of, uh of a comeback in case you end up losing the board once, because this deck really doesn't like it if you remove your board. And also with the idea of Topior being in the deck, I wanted as many nature cards as possible here, so that's why this is in the deck in my opinion, but I just wanted to give myself a little bit of an ego boost here, because apparently this is one of the best decks to be playing for the Druid class, and Druid's kind of struggling right now, at least compared to all the other classes. But this is still a fantastic deck in order to, in order to try to grind a legend, however, I feel like this deck starts to taper off a little bit at the diamond ranks, but if you're below the diamond ranks, this deck will slaughter any unoptimized deck that you will come across. As much as I despise the pure paladin decks of the world, this deck is actually something that I'm going to recommend to people because Crusader Aura really gives uh, Paladin a different way of being played to where we're not just going all in on Horn anymore. In fact, the Horn isn't even in this deck, so I still despise this archetype just because this card in particular is still something that drives me crazy. And if you're playing Mech Rogue, you probably also hate this card. Because imagine you play your Lab Constructor, and then suddenly it just gets it just gets turned into a 1-1, one, one, and then the minions that you're copying are 1-1s. One, so this is probably one way that you can try to counter Mech Rogue a little bit by being like the aggressor that can kind of fight back against their big minions. And then you have Crusader Aura, which is an insane... Just This card is absolutely insane. I know I talked about it already a little bit, but I'm just really trying to hammer in how good this ability is because the best way that I've heard this described, it's like a four mana bloodlust, except it lasts three turns, and as long as you have a minion attack with it, it will for sure get the buff so you're not missing any kind of value. So that's the reason why this deck runs Mustard for Battle, it runs the Biggin, it runs Stand Against Darkness, and even Lord Lor Lothraxian, I think that's how you pronounce it. Even this card makes its way into the deck. And do I have this card golden? Okay, I just give them to me golden. But regardless, this deck is is really consistent to the point where I may start hating Pure Paladin again. But this deck is definitely outclassed by a lot of stuff at Top Legend to where you're not really going to be seeing it in Top Legend unless people are trying to counter something in particular. Uh, but Pure Paladin looks like it's got a bunch of new value for it. Uh, the Pure Raider being 6 now is still, you know, something that needed to happen, but with Lorexian being a demon, you can consistently draw this card off of it, plus your Light Rays, and even with the, yeah, and we also have an Undead in this deck, so there's just a lot of value coming from the Pure Raider now. But Pure Paladin is looking like a really good deck to climb, probably pretty safely to Legend. But if Pure Paladin is not your thing, then Mech Paladin is probably the second best thing, because unfortunately, the other Paladin archetypes, like, like, the Jade Paladin, not a good deck. Big Paladin, not a good deck. Control Paladin, fun deck, but it's not a good deck. So it's just, if you want to play Paladin and you want to win games, you kind of have to go all in on the aggro packages that are available to you. And obviously, I don't I don't have to tell you how good Mech Paladin is with cards like Inventor Aura uh, being really, really good in this deck in order to cheat out a gigantic mech all in one turn. It ain't no mech rogue, but it's the second best thing, because I don't think there's another mech deck that's seeing a lot of play in standard as of right now. Uh, but yeah, this deck's very straightforward. I don't think I have to explain the card choices, because there's really not anything all too crazy in this deck. The craziest thing is the Magatha. That, that's, that's really about it, and it makes sense to run Magatha in this deck when you only run four spells entirely in the deck. And honestly, you want to play Radar Detection as soon as you can. So, Mech Paladin is a really good deck that if you want to just have some pretty quick games with a deck that doesn't have that much difficulty to it, then this can be an easy deck that you can use to definitely get to Diamond, but once you get to Diamond, hitting Legend might be a little bit difficult. Next up, we have Thaddeus Warlock, and honestly, the reason why this deck isn't in Tier 1 is because the combo decks have pushed this deck out of the Legend Realm to the point where it's just a really good deck to be playing at the lower ranks, because my god, the, the scams that this deck can do are absolutely insane. I, I'm pretty sure everybody here is already familiar with what this deck can do, but just in case you're not familiar with it, uh, Forge of Wills is, in, is, in, is just insane. It's an insane card. Comboing it with Anubisath is obviously like the first thing that a lot of people thought of, but one thing that happens to me very frequently whenever I go up against this deck is if my opponent's playing on coin, they'll play this on turn 3 and then on turn 5, they'll coin into the Loken to get Thaddeus and then suddenly you have two 11-11 minions on turn 5 and there are not a lot of decks that could deal with that. So aside from Slime being like the obvious, you know, scam card of this deck, 
There's another scam in this deck as well, just summoning really big minions off of the Forge of Will, and then you can scam away a, a, a board with the with the Sarge, getting rid of everything. You can scam a bunch of face damage. You can scam anything off the Symphony. Like, this deck has just literally got scam written all over it, and there's just no other way to put this deck. It's just all in on summoning really gigantic boards that your opponent has no business of dealing with. But regardless, I think there might be another Warlock deck that's actually not that bad right now. And that deck is Curse Warlock. I think that Curse Warlock might be pretty good in the Sif Mage because every single time that I've seen this archetype, I've been playing the Sif Mage and I felt very unfavored because the curse cards really add up. And the thing about the curse cards that some people may forget is that Solid Alibi can't defend against them. So Solid Alibi just really doesn't even help you against this archetype because they're going to keep filling your hand with like 3 damage, 4 damage, 5 damage. Maybe even getting to 8 damage if you ha they haven't killed you yet somehow. But this deck has a lot of gas against Sif Mage in particular. To where it just makes sense to be running this kind of archetype now. And some of you may be confused about the Drone Deconstructor in this deck. But the reason why this is in here, and it's a big brain inclusion, is so you can get yourself a 1-1 one -one that works with Defile in order to set up some kind of Defile combo. And if you have uh, this on the field as well, then you already have a 1 and a 2 on the field, so you can uh, immediately deal 3, potentially dealing more if your opponent already has a gigantic board already summoned. So this deck has a lot of uh, of, of stonks, I guess. You know, it's kind of just gone up because it's, it's the counter to Sif Mage. But it really surprised me that apparently Curse Warlock is a good deck again. It may start to taper off at Top Legend like, like all the decks that I have in this current uh, tier right now. But Curse Warlock seems to be coming back as a way to counter some of the decks that are on top right now. And now to finish off this tier list, I'm going to show you guys some really fun decks that can get wins, but are definitely going to be like tier 3, tier 4 at the very, very best. And one of them I am very sad to report... It is Plague Death Knight. Plague Death Knight is a deck that's really good that, uh, that I will be making a video on later today. Uh, but the reason why this deck is not that good is just because it can't beat Mech Rogue and it can't beat these gigantic scams. This is probably the fairest new deck that we've seen just because this deck is just trying to tempo cards and it actually requires your opponent to take their turns in order for you to actually win the game because obviously they got to draw the plagues at some point, right? And I've said this a lot with Plague DK, but... I wanted this to be an aggro deck to where, like, the plagues could maybe, like, finish off our opponent. But that was the wrong way to try and build this archetype. The way to build this archetype is to try and stall the game as long as you physically can. So that way your opponent will always be able to draw the plagues, uh, like, at some point. Versus, like, oh, I hope that they draw the plagues this turn sort of thing. Because if you keep the game going, they'll eventually keep drawing their cards to where their deck is only full of plagues. Especially if you play your Hell Yeah. And I really wish I had the Diamond card, but I am not spending 50 bucks on this card i refuse to, to do that uh but yeah this card is a hell yeah that four out of four ten out of ten whatever you want to whatever you want to rate it uh but the way that this deck has been built is that you have cards like hardcore cultist that's an aoe you have hollow hound which essentially acts as like a mini aoe but also gives you healing for sustainability the chain guardian can help you deal with those really big minions the primus can scam uh, those gigantic mechs that maybe are played in the later stages of the game, but you also give yourself some HP, because the effect off the Primus that's most common is just the Rune of Blood's, uh, ability. It's not just because it removes a, a, a minion off the field for free, essentially, but you do gain health as well, so it keeps you, it, it keeps you sustained, it keeps you alive, and you want to be able to survive in order for your opponent to draw those plague cards. The one thing that I feel like is really sad about this deck in particular is that we're not running the uh, the Frozen Over card. And the reason for this is because, one, you really don't want to help out your opponent by helping them draw cards, even though they can't play them going into the next turn. Two, you don't want your, to, you don't want your opponent to have a full hand, because if they always have a full hand, then they're never going to draw their plagues. But more importantly, number three, you just don't care about passing up your turn for two mana. Like, you'd rather be doing something a little bit more proactive, like discovering a card, or discovering a card, or discovering a card. I, I Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. But this deck is really, really fun, but it's definitely a more fair deck that isn't, like, going to be a Tier 1 meta breaker. But I still think this is probably one of the most fun decks that you can be playing right now, except for some of these really big decks that I've got planned up next. Next up is the archetype that I also really wanted to be popular and good, but unfortunately the reason why this deck isn't good is because it can't deal with the combos and it can't deal with the early aggression that mech decks can produce. 
But one thing that I want to point out is a lot of people are probably looking at this deck being like, oh, so we just win with Drum Circle and maybe we can do something gimmicky with Aaron, with uh, Aaron R, the Lifebinder, Freya, as well as Astellor. Nope, you guys are you guys are not looking at the right card. Ignis the Eternal Flame is actually the big card of this deck that gives you win conditions because you literally just want to ramp to 10 mana, have a, a your your embrace of nature forged so that way you can make the 10 mana weapon which gives you a 10 mana 5/6 weapon and it's at 60% getting win fury. You just want to go for win fury to where that weapon by itself in 3 turns is going to kill your opponent almost every single time if you can make it to that point in the game. And since we're running cards like the Groovy Cat, you can make this 5-6 weapon with Wind Fury potentially deal 10 damage, uh, or I'm sorry, dealing 20 damage because you'll be at 10 attack very, very easily. And the reason why Fizzle is in this deck in order to give, it's in order to give you uh, more Groovy Cats, it can give you uh, extra Freyas to where you can potentially go infinite, but this is definitely a deck that needs a slower meta in order to be thriving in because it just crumbles it crumbles against these aggressive mech rogue decks so unfortunately that is the deck to be beating right now as well as these other otk decks so it's like by by 10 mana hopefully by like turn six you better be killing your opponent with big weapon otherwise some of these decks are just gonna like have this insane combo that just blows you out of the water but i really wanted to highlight this deck because Aranar the life binder was my favorite titan and unfortunately it feels like one of the weaker ones just because it's not necessarily a weak card it's just it doesn't hit the field when you need it to the reno ability is definitely massive but if you're getting otk'd for like 60 damage it doesn't really matter if you're healing yourself but i just had to put this deck on the on the tier list because it's one of my favorite decks it's one of my one of the most fun decks that i played so far but I'd be having more fun with it if it could actually win more games, because I think I went like 3-9 and nine or something with this deck. It really was not that good of a win rate, to the point where I didn't feel confident enough to put this as its own standalone video yet. I gotta get some more wins with this before I actually make a video out of it. But regardless, Mommy Druid is one of my favorite archetypes that I really just wanted to share with you guys. And now we're getting into the big decks. If you guys haven't seen this deck on ladder yet, then I feel sorry for you. Because I believe this was a deck that was posted on Reddit. And oh my god, sometimes Reddit just knocks it out of the park. In case you guys don't know what's going on here, the whole point of this deck is to try and make your Storm Giants cost zero mana by forging it a whole bunch of times to the point where you could potentially bring it back with Animate Dead. But I would argue if you've only thought about that, you're not thinking big enough because Melted Maker is such a good card in this deck to where if you've already got the zero mana forge card, since it can literally uh, forge endlessly, you can keep forging it and keep giving yourselves multiple copies of zero mana cards, which is just massive, by the way. It is massive, and it leads to really, really fun boards to where if you have extra copies of Melted Maker, then you can consistently do this combo over and over and over again, and you're essentially like... You're essentially spending two mana to give yourself an extra zero mana card, so that way you can just keep summoning big board after big board after big board. And with the consistency of creation protocol, uh, being able to discover a copy of, uh, of a minion in your deck, you only have three minions. You have the Storm Giant, you have the Melted Maker, and the Amon Thule, which just makes sense in this deck in order to give you extra resource generation as well as removing very key minions from your opponent. So this card just feels really good to be running in your deck to where I would highly recommend it. Uh, but one other thing that I would recommend is Love Everlasting in this deck because, oh my god, being able to play these other cards for zero mana is massive at times. And one other thing that I want to uh, enlighten you guys to is there might be some situations where you just want to play your Melted Maker as quickly as possible before you play your Storm Giant in an, in an effort to bring it back with the animate dead so you can keep forging endlessly for essentially uh so you could do the same combo but you're spending two mana less for bringing back the minion for one mana so this deck is just really really fun i got a video uh planned on this that'll be coming out either today or tomorrow it depends on how quickly i can get it edited but oh my god giants decks are looking really really fun right now and continuing on with the trend what about a giant druid that focuses on you know keeping itself alive with like armor cards 
as well as like it also i also didn't get to talk about funnel cake but funnel cake is the main reason why like this deck feels really good is because you play a bunch of minions for zero you funnel cake you give yourself even more mana and then you keep making even more minions with the melted maker uh, forge combo but with this deck in particular you have unending swarm in order to bring back those giants as many times as you can so it's just really really funny how this deck can work i almost want to like put in like a freya in this deck in order to copy the uh the unending swarms but i feel like that would be a little bit too much like even uh like your summer flower child is already drawing like these cards here so maybe that card isn't that good and and in full transparency i have not played this deck yet but this has like been like the number one deck that people have been asking in my chat hey clark have you seen this deck hey clark have you played this deck yet this deck's really cool by the way have you played it so I'm going to show this deck to you guys because it just feels like a really fun deck that maybe won't get a lot of wins. But the big thing about this deck is just how much fun it is. It is just so much fun in order to throw out zero mana, eight, eight taunts. And in the right matchups, this could be pretty powerful. Not going to lie, man. And you still have Ignis in the deck in order to give you even more consistency. I would argue this is not a deck you want to go for 10 mana weapon, probably five mana weapon with like lifesteal or something. But oh my god. I absolutely love the giant interaction with Melted Maker. In fact, I love this interaction so much that I have actually seen someone play this version of the deck against me on ladder. And I'll just say that I've only seen this deck once because Warrior's in a kind of awkward spot right now. Like, I really think that Warrior might need some help right now because it can't deal with mech rogue it can't really deal with these otks that are possible and there's no like aggro warrior right now like there's no there's no way to like pressure with like tempo unfortunately it feels like the only good warrior archetypes right now are still in rage warrior in all honesty odin is a really cool card but unfortunately the archetype just has too much of a setup and to where like if the meta was a little bit slower this combo would feel like it's very consistent but the fact that you have to make it to turn eight and then do something really uh, really impressive by turn nine is the only thing that's keeping a de an archetype like this behind just because you can't deal with mech rogue that's like the big thing right now i hope you guys have realized this throughout watching this video that mech rogue is the deck that you gotta beat and if your deck doesn't beat mech rogue then it's going to have some trouble right now but regardless, this is like a control warrior deck that still has cards like Bladestorm, Brawl, as well as like the, the Rift package in order to pressure onto the board as well as you can. But the main reason why I really like this deck is because you might be able to play Last Stand with your Storm Giant to where you can forge a bunch of 16-16 minions with the Melted Maker combo. So I haven't played this deck yet. I really want to give it a chance uh, later today over on my stream, but I'm probably not going to give this deck that many chances because if it doesn't do this combo in particular, it will fold to the massive decks that I'm seeing at Top Legend right now. But regardless, I had to share this archetype and I had to share these three giants Giants decks because the the titans expansion knocked it out of the park dude i absolutely love the flavor of these decks and i love how much fun it is to play all these new archetypes to the point where i literally was like looking at so many decks wondering which ones to put on this list which ones to exclude and i just i wanted to put them all that's why i gave you five of the top best decks five of the best decks to actually grind a legend and now five fun decks that i believe are really worth your time if you're just trying to you know Tickle that little part of your brain that loves to play zero mana cards. I love zero mana cards, and I really think it's what makes Hearthstone feel like Hearthstone at times. But regardless, giant decks are super fun that I had to recommend them to you guys. Well, that will conclude this deck list video, and hopefully you guys enjoyed all the different archetypes and all the different strategies I uh, showed you here, because there's a lot of really fun stuff in this expansion. I am not saying this lightly, but this is probably going to become one of my favorite expansions if this trend continues, and it's... As of right now, my favorite expansion of all time was Knights of the Frozen Throne because of the uh, the hero cards that were uh, given to us. I really love the idea of the hero cards at the time. And the Titans are essentially hero cards, but they're on minions. So it makes a lot more sense to like kind of go in this different direction to where hero powers aren't just going to completely dominate the game like with the 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 frostless janas of the uh, of the world and whatnot now we just have titans that give you an insane payoff as soon as you summon them and you don't have to worry about them snowballing the game for the rest of the game it's just about how you're able to utilize those cards when you have them available to you but if this continues Titans might legitimately become my favorite expansion that Hearthstone has ever come out with, and that's why I am so excited to be playing these decks and to be making this content for you. And again, if you want to support the channel and if you want to see more videos like this, please like this video and please subscribe to the channel in order to let me know that you want more content from Clark Hellscream. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this video, and if you make it to the end of this video, I love you.
go ahead and comment I love you too down in the comments in order to let me know that you saw this message. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. We'll see you for the next one.